Hello and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. Today's show is going to be awesome. We're going to talk about bridge to agency financing uh, for multifamily properties. And this is a great program for value add type of deals, multifamily properties. Typically, these are anywhere on the low end from a million dollar loan to seven and a half million dollars. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Kevin Leonard. Kevin brings over 20 years of real estate experience to his current role. Kevin leads the Charlotte, North Carolina office and is involved in originating, structuring and pricing fixed rate multifamily and bridge loans for the firm. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thanks, Bo. It's nice to be with you. I've enjoyed listening to previous episodes and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Okay, so uh, for everybody that's uh, listening or watching this in the future, uh, we're going to take a deep dive on on a bridge to agency type of deal. And uh, ReadyCap uh, is a licensed Freddie Mac lender. Um, we're going to talk about why you would you might want to go bridge to agency. And so a lot of times agency debt, um, they have certain kind of criteria that the property has to meet. It has to be 90% uh, occupancy, both physically and economically. Uh, the, the sponsors have to meet certain net worth requirements and they have to have certain post-close liquidity. And they also have to have experience in owning multifamily property. So if you own a bunch of single family duplexes and fourplexes, that's not considered multifamily. It's got to own five plus units. So a lot of investors out there um, will, will call me and they're looking to, to maybe purchase a property. And so the, you know, the first couple of questions in the conversation, what's the occupancy? What's, wh what's the occupancy? Is there a heavy value add component? Is there a big CapEx budget? Um, What's the plans the, for the property? How long are you going to hold it? And then, then you dive into the questions about the sponsor, you know, net worth. You have to have certain net worth requirements. You, the, the property obviously has to meet certain benchmarks. Now, if it doesn't meet the benchmarks, meaning the occupancy level is lower, that's when a bridge loan might be the best option. And the, the advantages to the bridge to agency is that you're getting underwritten for the agency takeout uh, from day one. So the, the bridge portion of the loan could be a 12 or 24 month term. Typically it's usually interest only. And really that's, that's a loan to get you to be able to, to, to refinance into the agency takeout portion. How was that as a description? Was that pretty good, Kevin? Uh, that's uh, very good. Um, uh, I think probably uh, a lot of, a lot to absorb there uh, and, and very much on the mark. I think the, probably the best thing that I could uh, start off the conversation with as it relates to uh, our product and any other bridge loan uh, is um, to start with the end in mind. What is the, the, the key, one of the keys to a good bridge loan is having certainty of the execution on the takeout or you know, is it gonna be a sale or is it gonna be a refinance? Is somebody gonna hold it long-term or are they planning on selling it to someone else after they've added value in, you know, to, to take it from the current state of affairs, be it low occupancy, physical or economic, uh, or improvements to the physical condition of the property and the management of the property, all those factors can come into why it makes sense to start with a bridge loan and then move to an agency loan for, or a permanent loan, even if it's not an agency loan. Um, so start with the end in mind. That'll help guide the thoughts and structuring and sizing of the loan um, you know, on the front end. And if, if you're a sponsor, a lot of a lot of us um, investors that are um, maybe they're not so much maybe they're they're newer or they're finding opportunities in, in tertiary markets right now. Um, what are some tips for um, these type of investors that are looking in their, their smaller MSAs and, and what should they know about sizing up deals in, in, in smaller markets? I mean, is there any kind of um, websites or anything they should get, get to us so we can sure. size up the deal for them appropriately, like going in so they know what to expect on because uh, there might be some LTV haircuts and so forth. Sure. Sure. Yes. Uh, again, that, comes back to the idea of start with the end in mind and, um, and also understanding the sizing parameters for the takeout uh, with, let's 
Freddie Mac is who I'm most familiar with because we do a ton of business with them. Um, so, for example, if you're talking about a secondary or tertiary market, the uh, the sizing of the permanent loan that you that the property would qualify for will be subject to LTV constraints and debt service coverage restraints um, when you're looking at the takeout. So you want to size the loan so that if you're expecting a certain NOI after the property has been improved and stabilized, uh, then if you're in a small market with Freddie Mac, uh, you should expect the future sizing to be based on a maximum loan to value ratio of 70% or better. And by better, I mean a lower LTV uh, or, or and simultaneously a minimum debt service coverage ratio of 1.3 or better, and by better, I mean 1.3x or higher on the debt service coverage ratio. So as the markets get smaller, the underwriting criteria and the sizing gets more conservative. And the idea there is in larger markets, like you know Los Angeles, San Francisco, DC, New York, what Freddie Mac refers to as top tier markets or top markets, there's a larger pool of potential buyers. So they, Freddie Mac and the lenders feel more comfortable being more aggressive in higher LTVs and lower debt service coverage ratios. As the markets get smaller, the pool of potential buyers gets smaller. And so therefore they take a more conservative approach requiring lower LTV and higher debt service coverage ratio. So those things kind of move in opposite directions with one another. So from a sizing standpoint going in, um, you know, if you're looking at the bridge loan piece of it to acquire the property and improve the property, you want to make sure to think about, okay, my going in net operating income day one, when I close on this deal should probably be no less than five to 6% of the initial loan amount. So we call that a debt yield. So the NOI divided by the initial loan amount used to acquire the property, that percentage should be no less than five or 6% minimum. And that's gonna vary some based on the market and how big or small it is for us as, as, as a lender ready cap. Um, we can get a little bit skinnier than that in larger top markets. Again, our appetite for leverage increases with the size and quality of the market and the breadth of buyers and sellers in the market. The liquidity of the market itself helps inform our decisions on how aggressive or conservative to be on the loan. So coming back to initial funding and, and the total funding, we can talk a little bit about the differences between those two in the bridge loan scenario. Okay, so let's take your, what I, what I would call a quote, classic value add multifamily situation, um, where you're buying a property that Occupancy might be at say 75 or 85%. So it doesn't qualify for an agency loan out, out of the gate because you're not at that 90% occupancy for the last 90 days criteria. So maybe occupancy is below that par or the property has been uh, mismanaged and the condition is rough. And there's other properties nearby that are of higher quality that if you can improve the subject property that you're buying with capital expenditures to the unit interiors, the exteriors of buildings and the grounds and the amenities. So you want to improve the quality of the property to justify higher rents. Then you, know, you can also add in the CapEx dollars to the initial loan amount to arrive at what we refer to as the fully funded loan amount. So you've got three pieces to the funding puzzle, initial funding, future funding for capital expenditures, and then the two of those combined you would view as the fully funded loan, okay? And the, the initial funding and the future funding are relevant for determining your going in debt yield numbers. Again, that's the as-is NOI at acquisition divided by the loan amount initially funded. And then the as-stabilized debt yield is defined as the projected net operating income after you've completed the capital expenditures, and gotten the rents and occupancy stabilized at market rates. 
So that future NOI based on those projections divided by the initial funding plus the future funding for CapEx, the sum of those two is your fully funded loan amount. So you wanna have an as stabilized debt yield of say 8%. So you go from an initial debt yield, of, call it 5%, you add value by deploying dollars and work and sweat and blood and tears. And, um, and then you've got an improved property with higher occupancy and higher rents. So that as stabilized debt yield should be greater than your going in debt yield. If it's not, then you got a problem. <laughs> Either the marketplace didn't accept what you've done or you made a serious mis misjudgment. And so we try to do a lot of work on the front end to uh, support the projected rent comps and projected future sale values so that we feel comfortable with the, the business plan as presented by the deal sponsor. And, and then, so let's say they executed their plan uh, in 10 months. You, they, we underwrote it as a 18 month term or 12 month term. And, and then they haven't owned it quite. Do, do they always want to own it for at least 12 months prior to refinancing to get max proceeds, uh, assuming the debt service coverage is, is, is good and it's a top tier market? They, in theory, they could go to 80% in a tier one market. Right. The, right. So, so does typically the, does Freddie Mac usually want to see 12 month seasoning before they max cash out to 80? Yes, exactly. So they, they, if you're inside of 12 months of ownership, Freddie Mac is typically going to look really closely and hew very closely to some ratio of loan to cost. Once you get beyond 12 months, they tend to look more closely at loan to value. And, and the underwriting parameters that are relevant to that type of calculation. But inside of 12 months, if you execute your business plan super fast and want to go ahead and refinance, you're probably still going to need to have some skin in the game, okay? Um, everybody as a lender likes to see that borrowers have skin in the game. But once you've executed the business plan and um, shown that the marketplace has accepted what your proposed business plan was and, and you're following through on that with rents that support the values then loan to cost becomes less of a factor now let's let's talk about the sponsorship team let's say they're they don't quite meet um underwriting standards for uh, a freddie mac takeout um do, will they look at will they look at marginal sponsors uh, b because they're going to own and operate or, or from day one they have to meet those benchmarks net worth uh, experience and post close liquidity well they freddie mac does have uh, an exception request process and procedure um and the short answer to your question is they will entertain sponsors that don't quite meet the bar on uh credit rating liquidity or net worth or experience or maybe some combination of those two but when you start layering those things one on top of the other then it becomes less likely that you'll get an exception approved um, but one of them by itself is not necessarily a showstopper uh, also you got to think about if they're willing to grant that exception oftentimes they'll require some form of mitigant to offset the approval of that exception request. So sometimes that comes in the form of lower leverage, higher debt service coverage ratio, eliminating uh, interest only as part of the equation. So it's, it's kind of a horse trading game sometimes. So if you wanna get a little something, you gotta give up something else. Um, or they'll just grant it or not grant it. You know, it kind of depends on some, sometimes the day of the week and who you get as the underwriter at Freddie Mac as to whether or not they'll approve it um, or what you're able to offer up as a mitigant to the request. Um, so that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but the answer is yes, they'll consider exceptions and defining exactly how that comes out the other end is more of a subjective and holistic view of the situation and circumstances and the deep. Yeah. And I, and I also want to kind of point out too, I think what's important in this conversation is there's different buckets of bridge lenders. 
And typically a bridge to agency um, type of transaction, the pricing is gonna be far superior than the other buckets of bridge money. For example, the higher leveraged kind of riskier deals where they don't meet the bridge to agency kind of requirements, you're talking about rates that are eight or nine and even sometimes 10%. That's like the, the high, the high let risk deal, I would say, you know, as from a lending standpoint. And then there's kind of some like tier two type of bridge lenders, which their money might be anywhere from six to 8%. But when you get into like um, bridge to agency, that's where you're going to find the, the, the best, most inexpensive cost of funds for these type of transactions. That's why if you can do a bridge to agency deal, it, make, it usually makes sense because the coupon is m maybe in the high fours, low fives, depending the rates are going up right now, but versus six, seven, eight, nine percent And that's why I when, I, when when I'm talking to a potential uh, sponsor who's looking to, for options, it's always, if the property is a, kind of a bridge type of deal, it's usually a bridge to agency is usually always the first thought with, with many originators. That's what we're always looking for because it's going to be the cheapest cost of funds. It's, it's typically an IO. Um, there's also benefits for the sponsor because at the end of the day, uh, Kevin's team they, they want to they want to do the facilitate the bridge, but they they also want to facilitate the the takeout. And the takeout you're you're incentivized by staying the course, and there's discounts on the exit fees and so forth on a bridge to agency type of transaction. Um, so I want to point that out, that there are different tiers and different buckets of bridge lenders out there. Um, and then there's another bucket for like the super huge $30 million multifamily deals. Uh, they have a separate bucket. Um, we're talking multifamily one to seven and a half million on, on these type of deals, which is seems to be the, kind of the majority of the deals out there are between this range. I mean, um, I think if you look collectively at all the multifamily assets out there, it's probably the majority of, of them. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. Connected. So when, when sizing up a deal, uh, Kevin's talking about debt yields and that's how they're, they're figuring out on the bridge portion, the, the max proceeds uh, going in. And so if you fit the, the benchmarks, if your project fits the benchmark, essentially you can get up to 80% of the purchase price and, and, and a hundred percent of the future funding. So it's pretty high leverage with this bridge financing. Is that pretty accurate on if it's, you know, tier one market sponsor checks out the deal's solid, they can get that much leverage. Yeah. I think what I've, what I've found in the last several years, as I've been working on more and more of these value add multifamily deals in the small balance space. And by small balance, I'm referring to one to seven and a half million dollars is so often the most relevant metric to keep in mind for sizing the deal initially for the loan dollars themselves and also the loan to purchase price ratio is what's your going in debt yield. Okay. So again, your as is NOI at closing divided by the loan amount or divided by let's call it 0 0.05. Okay. That will get you in the ballpark of for a top market type of deal. Um, where we would land on initial loan dollars, okay? So using a, a numerical example, if the property that you're looking at day one at closing throws off $100,000 of net operating income, and if you divide that by 0 0.05, that's our required minimum debt yield, then you're gonna land right about $2 million on initial funding, okay? now what that is as a percentage of your purchase price 
know, that's a function of what you've negotiated on your purchase price. But so the, the most relevant constraint oftentimes in the small balance bridge to agency deals that I work on is day one NOI divided by the minimum debt yield will get you in the right ballpark, maybe not necessarily on the dollar amount itself, but in the right ballpark of what we'll be looking at for initial funding. And then add to that your planned capital expenditures to arrive at what your approximate fully funded loan amount is, and then multiply that times at least 0 0.075 to arrive at a ballpark of what the maximum loan dollars are on the fully funded basis. So again, that, that doing it you know, verbally, it doesn't necessarily make all that much sense for some folks. I, I know I'm more of a visual person, so I like to see my spreadsheet in front of me when I'm you know, talking through these numbers, but um, if you're just kind of jotting, that, jotting down the numbers, that, those are kind of uh, rubrics or uh, rules of thumb that I use when talking to people. That, that's very good. What are some tips? Um, uh, typically, what do you want to see in a package? Let's just say it's a value add. It's going to be a bridge agency uh, that we, we discussed. And just, Sure. So uh, can you kind of walk us through like what should be in the initial package that they send? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let's start. First of all, start with the property address. Very basic, but that we need that uh, because we want to know a little bit about their location and where it sits in the market and, and what market it sits in. Um, then we want to see a current rent roll, um, the current T12 trailing 12 months of income and expenses, ideally broken down on a monthly basis, so the T12 by month, and then historical operating statements to see what a property has been performing at, ideally for the last, at least the last two years prior to the T12. Uh, so right, we're recording this at the beginning of March 2022. So we'd like to see the last 12 months of income and expenses and the full year income and expenses for 21 and 20. Again, the current rent roll to see what the occupancy is, uh, if there's any outstanding balances from tenants, uh, what those outstanding balances are so that we can uh, get a good read on economic occupancy in addition to the physical occupancy. If the current owner uh, has performed any capital expenditures over the last three years. We'd love to know what those are in as much detail as they have available and willing to share. Uh, and then for the buyer, our potential client, we want to see what their planned capital expenditures are in as much detail as they're able and willing to provide. So in unit interiors, what does that encompass and how much does it cost? Uh, building exteriors, grounds, amenities, those types of things. Um, and then we want to see information about the, prop, the sponsors on the deal, their experience. Ideally, we'd like to see a couple of case studies where they've done this before, where they can show that we bought, a pro we bought property X, plowed Y number of dollars into that transaction, into that property, and came out with a new and improved product that was performing better. And we either still own it and we refinanced it or we sold it. And we realized this as a result of those efforts. So we'd like to see some case studies, ideally, of similar types of projects so that we can have confidence that the borrowers can execute the business plan. We'd like to know who their planned property manager is if there's a significant amount of um, construction work to be done in the capital improvements, who's gonna be overseeing that? And have they chosen a general contractor or are they gonna hire their own subs to do it all? Um, again, that ties in with the case studies. How did they do that in the past? Are they gonna use the same vendors again? Um, and then also um, what their exit plan is. Are they gonna sell it or are they gonna hold it and refinance it? So that will also inform the underlying fee structure on exit fees so that we can structure that so that it matches up with the borrower's business plan. So if you're um, a lender, you're typically gonna have an exit fee on the bridge loan. But as a agency takeout or a permanent lender also, 
we're willing to waive exit fees if we get a second bite of the apple on the permanent loan when it's time for that. If we don't get that second bite, then we want to make sure that we get paid according to the loan terms, but the borrower might want to have a little bit lighter exit fee, and we're willing to negotiate that and, and work with them on that. There's usually a little bit of an adder to the spread or the interest rate to make up for the absence or a lesser exit fee, but you know, everything's open to discussion to a point. Uh, so we're willing to work with them on that. So those are the key elements of what we're looking for in an initial loan request package. So property information, property performance, sponsor information, sponsor performance, business plan, timeline. Got it. And also the, the, the vendors that they plan on using for the various aspects of the project. And, and Freddie Mac, like only, there's only a certain amount of lenders that are actually direct licensed through Freddie Mac. Like there's right. maybe 20. I don't know what the number is. Like it's 20. I think it's, it's, closer, I think it's closer to about a dozen. Okay. Uh, on this, on the small balance loan product. Yeah. We're one of a dozen and we're in the top five. Right. So, so when there's a broker like myself, pretty much it's going to go to the top. The, there's only about five lenders that's going to actually be the right fit to size this up for Freddie Mac, right? So, so ReadyCap is a huge player in this space. So just kind of putting some, you know, some insight out there to people that might not understand that there's only, people often say that they do lend agency debt, but really there's only like five or six big players in the space that are doing the small balance agency lending and, and ReadyCap specializes in, in Freddie and it's very good at sizing up these deals. So it's always the first, you know, when I, when I have a client that's acquiring a property and it's a bridge type of deal, I'm always first want to, want to, you know, everybody wants to know what's rate and term is everybody's first question, the sponsors, but really, it's really about the project first, you know, is it actually going to be a fit, you know, based on the scenario? And then, and then do you as a sponsor meet the benchmarks to, to, to fly for a bridge agency? If not, then you're probably going to be in one of those other bridge loan buckets um, and it's not the, the end of the world, but there's a, you know, it's a big difference in rate and term in the bridge space. And that's kind of why I wanted to bring Kevin on the show today, just kind of talk about how these bridge agency loans get sized up and food for thought for, for, for you listening right now. Like when you're looking at multifamily deals, cause maybe you don't have the experience, but a lot of times in multifamily, it's more of a team sport. So you can bring the right pieces together. We see that. Pretty much in every multifamily deal, there's there's the the key principal that's got the balance sheet, and then there's the person that's operating finds the deal, and then there's the person with the experience, and they they go together as general partners in the deal. And the reason why most multifamily operators prefer agency debt is because it's the rates and terms are advantageous. It's um, non recourse debt with personal uh, with bad boy carve outs. So if you go to a bank or credit union, sometimes their terms are decent, but usually their amortization is only 20 or 25 versus agencies of 30 year AM. And also those loans are with banks or credit unions are usually always recourse. So you have to sign a personal guarantee. So that's why most of the seasoned operators end up using agency debt. And, and that's why I wanted to do the show. Not to say that banks and credit unions aren't, they're a place to probably get started. And then if you're building a big portfolio and raising money and so forth, you, you're going to move your way into agency type of debt. Um, any closing thoughts on, um, you know, if there's somebody listening right now and, you know, just some guidance uh, as far as, um, you know, f financing or refinancing properties in today's market. Um, I, we don't, we don't have any COVID reserves anymore. Has that been right. completely eliminated? What, what other kind of interesting points would you point out as we close well, out? We, we've talked a good bit about the debt yield targets on an, going in and an as stabilized basis. And one thing that if, there, if there's ever a reason why we wind up passing on a, a bridge to agency deal, it usually comes down to uh, there's insufficient in place NOI. It doesn't meet the, the going in debt yield target. And a lot of times, bridge, great bridge loan opportunities and great value add multifamily op opportunities occur when the management 
of the asset and or the condition of the asset do not get a property to sufficient occupancy and income levels to hit that debt yield target day one. So if I have to pass on a loan of the value add multifamily bridge to agency type in the last two years, it's almost always a function of insufficient net operating income walking in the door. Very few times when we're, we as a lender are willing to make an, an exception on that parameter. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. That's a deal that probably should get done if the property can get put into stronger hands and the quality of the collateral improved through capital expenditures and better management. But it's not, it might not necessarily be our deal. Doesn't mean it's not, it can't find a home. It just won't be our deal. It will be a place that has more of an appetite for risk on day one at a little bit higher rate, just like what you were talking about before. So there are different lenders that have appetites for different types of deals. Uh, the, the day one debt yield to agency type of deal, that's where we live and breathe. Um, so thank you for kind of making that part of the conversation early on. But I just wanted to let people know that if there's ever a reason why I pass on deals, usually that's the most frequent reason. That is fantastic advice. Well, Kevin, it's been a pleasure. And I know everybody that's watching this or will watch this in the future, rather, it's going to get a lot of value out of this. So I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to closing some deals with you. And, and, and uh, thank you so much. Thanks, bud. We'll talk soon.